it's amazing how much a career can change in just a year's time. For a fighter like Jorge Masvidal, 2019 was all he needed to reach massive stardom and have a belt they made up just for one of his fights put around his waist by the world's biggest movie star, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. But just as fortunes can change for the better in a year's time, so can they move in the opposite direction. And today we're going to take a look at the 10 unfortunate fighters who just had absolutely terrible years in their career. The type of year that can take you from elite to the chopping block, from contender to the prelims, and from champion to a bitter career end. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 worst years for a fighter in MMA history. Number 10. Johnny Hendricks there are few fighters that have nearly dethroned all-time great George St. Pierre, but at UFC 167, Johnny Hendricks was dangerously close in a split decision loss. After the bout, GSP would vacate the title and take time away from the sport, leaving a void for Big Rig to fill when he defeated Robbie Lawler at UFC 171 to capture welterweight gold. He would lose the title to Lawler in the very next bout at UFC 181 in another razor-thin split decision. And while it sounds like that might be the era of time we're speaking of for this entry, it's not. Things got much worse for Johnny Hendricks. After defeating Matt Brown at UFC 185, Johnny was on his way back to the title and was set to face collegiate wrestling rival Tyron Woodley. However, Hendricks had a weight cut issue that landed him in the hospital with kidney stones and intestinal blockage, so the bout was canceled, setting up the horrible 2016 of the former champion. The first bout of the year for Hendricks would be against the up-and-coming Stephen Thompson. Wonderboy was on the come-up, but certainly not believed the caliber of Hendricks yet. Johnny would be shockingly TKO'd in the first first round, the first time he had ever been finished in his career. Next up that July at UFC 200 was another disaster. Hendricks would miss weight on the way to losing to the always tough Calvin Gastelum via a decision. Again, a fight Hendricks was expected to win. Gastelum had lost two of his last three prior to the bout. Between the two losses and the weight cutting issues, Johnny's year was not going well at all, and the perception of him as a fighter had changed considerably. He ended the year with Neil Magny at UFC 207, a fight a bit lower now on the welterweight ladder. Johnny would miss weight again for a second time in a row, this time by two and a half pounds. The two fighters had a great fight, but in the end, Hendricks would not get the judge's nod. 2016 marked a turning point for Johnny's career, and it was the beginning of the end, as he would move to middleweight that next year and would retire from MMA by June of 2018. Number 9. Dan Henderson when Dan Henderson returned to the UFC from Strikeforce in 2011, he was about as hot as he'd ever been in his career. After capturing the Strikeforce light heavyweight title, Hendo would defeat the legendary Fedor Emelianenko via a first-round TKO, and then in his first fight back in the UFC, had a legendary all-time great fight with Shogun Hua, which he won via unanimous decision, setting him up for a title fight with John Jones. After reaching such heights, Henderson would have to famously pull out of the Jones fight with an injury a week before UFC 151, causing the UFC to cancel an event for the first time in history. After taking a 15-month absence to heal up, Henderson's shitty year began with a title eliminator bout against Lyoto Machida at UFC 157 to earn back his chance at John Jones. The fight was lackluster to say the least, and a frustrated Henderson would lose via a split decision to the elusive Machida, not exactly how he wanted to regain that momentum from 2011. That summer, Henderson would attempt to rebound in a bout against former champion Rashad Evans in the main event of UFC 161. The fight was wasn't likely to generate a title shot, but was definitely a crucial victory for Hendo. Unfortunately, he would lose via a split decision yet again in a competitive fight that saw the two grapplers slug it out on the feet. But Hendo's year isn't over yet, oh no. The cherry on top of Dan's 2013 was a TRT-fueled first-round head kick KO from Vitor Belfort in Brazil at Fight Night 32. Henderson's career resurgence was one of the great stories of 2011, but by the end of 2013, things had taken a considerable turn, and Dan would go on to lose four of his last seven before retiring. Number 8. Marillo Bustamante once Pride and the UFC had established themselves as the premier organizations in all of mixed martial arts, the rivalry and questions about who had the best fighters and who could beat whom from each company immediately began, which is why it was a big deal when Marillo Bustamante defeated Dave Monet for the middleweight title to become the first Brazilian UFC champion, then defended it in a win against Matt Lindland, and then strapped for cash, signed with Pride FC. The organization had essentially stolen a UFC champion, and now it was time to see how he stacked up against the best of Pride. 
Pride. In his debut in mid-2003, Bustamante took a fight with Rampage Jackson on less than a week's notice to fill in for the quarterfinal round of the middleweight Grand Prix after his teammate Ricardo Arona had to drop out. What a trooper. Bustamante put on a show, having Rampage in serious trouble early, but would go on to lose a hard-fought close fight via split decision. Not the best start to your Pride career, but taking a fight on short notice, it's understandable. And the organization was eager to get him back in the ring for another fight after his showing. Bustamante was given a second chance at the tournament via a reserve bout with Dan Henderson a few months later. After the fight Marillo gave Rampage, it was assumed if Bustamante could get the fight to the ground, he would get the win. However, his first takedown attempt was met with a knee and a TKO finish in 53 seconds. Marillo would claim that it was a headbutt that rocked him and started the finishing sequence and not the knee from Henderson, but the loss would remain. And just a few days past a year since his Pride debut, Bustamante would have his third bout in the organization against rising Japanese star and judo ace Kazuhiro Nakamura at Pride Final Conflict 2004. Another hard-fought bout, but this time Bustamante was never really close to getting the win and would lose via a unanimous decision. From UFC champion to three straight losses in Pride in just a few days over a year. That is a tough swing. Bustamante would eventually make it to the welterweight Grand Prix Final in 2005, but would lose a second time to Dan Henderson. Number 7. Anthony Pettis when they put you on a Wheaties box, the pressure on you as champion has reached levels that can only come from the endorsement of a sugary breakfast cereal. Anthony Pettis was the future of mixed martial arts. He could do things nobody else could do. He was the lightweight champion, he was a snazzy dresser, and he was believed to be starting a run in the UFC as champion that would rival GSP and Anderson Silva. After defeating Benson Henderson to earn the lightweight strap, he defended the belt against Gilbert Melendez, and it was off to the races. He had beat the two best lightweights in the world. Who else was there? Well, there was Rafael Dos Anjos, but he was a plus 400 underdog, surely he would be a cakewalk for the Showtime kicking champion. He was not. RDA dominated Pettis for all five rounds in all facets of the fight. It was one of the most complete ass whoopings a champion had ever received in a title fight. Pettis planned on making a summer 2014 turnaround, but an injury sidelined him until he would fight Eddie Alvarez that next January at Fight Night 81. A win here would get Pettis right back in the title picture. Piece of cake. Alvarez was just some Bellator guy. Pettis was again a big betting favorite, and again he would lose, this time via a split decision, but it wasn't really that close. Eddie was a takedown machine. He basically replicated the game plan of RDA, and it worked perfectly. Fuck your Wheaties box. Pettis had now dropped two straight, and what appeared to be a formula for beating him was emerging. The UFC solution? Put Showtime against Edson Barbosa. They'll strike like crazy, it'll be fight of the night, Pettis will Showtime kick his way back to the title picture. After all, he was still ranked third at this time despite the two losses. But despite again being a betting favorite, Pettis again lost a decision. This time, Barbosa put on the performance of his life, kicking the holy hell out of Pettis, leaving his left leg and his ribs a mess. The champion of the future had lost three times in just over a year and was absolutely worked in all three fights. Pettis would move down to featherweight following his awful, awful year. Number 6. Tito Ortiz once the middleweight division in the UFC was renamed the light heavyweight division in 2000, there was one name synonymous with it, and that was Tito Ortiz. Ortiz captured the vacant title against Vanderlei Silva at UFC 25, and would then go on to defend the belt five times in a row through 2002, including a bout against bitter rival Ken Shamrock at UFC 40. Tito was a dominant champion. At this point in time, he was the face of the UFC. He was in many ways the face of mixed martial arts in the United States. He had never been hotter. It was the height of his powers as a star. And then, after a year of sitting out trying to work a deal with the UFC, the Huntington Beach bad boy returned to defend his crown against interim champion Randy Couture, and that was when his really bad, not-so-great year began. Tito was fully expected to destroy old man Couture, who had recently struggled at heavyweight before moving down to 205. Even his win for the interim title was seen as a surprise. Ortiz got worked all five rounds. He had absolutely no answer for Couture's wrestling, and even got humiliatingly spanked in the fifth round before losing a unanimous decision on all judges' scorecards. The biggest star in the UFC had just been dethroned and embarrassed, but the year was not over. The perfect rebound fight would be against Chuck Liddell. Both fighters had a long history, fans had been wanting to see the bout, and both needed a win. Tito, of course, had just lost his title, and Chuck had failed to win the Pride Middleweight Grand Prix after losing to Couture for the interim title earlier that year. It was the perfect fight for Tito to regain that spot at the top, where he could then challenge again for the title, which is 
why when he was KO'd in the second round, the Tito train had been officially derailed entirely. Ortiz would never recapture his lost title, but would remain a relevant star in the coming years due to his bitter rivalries with fighters like Ken Shamrock and Chuck Liddell. His place at the apex of the sport, though, was taken from him in just two fights in 2004. Number 5. Vanderlei Silva Vanderlei Silva was the fucking man in pride. There's no other way of stating it. The Axe Murderer's 22 victories were the most of any fighter in the organization's history. He won the middleweight title and defended it four times. He had the most knockouts in pride history, the most finishes, and the longest unbeaten streak. Vanderlei Silva was the fucking best. And going into his worst year ever, the pride champion would be viciously KO'd via a head kick by Mirko Krokop in the pride 2006 heavyweight Grand Prix semifinal because Vandy's crazy ass also fought at heavyweight weight even though he was horribly undersized. According to an interview with his wife, the KO changed Vandy forever, and the loss pretty much put the brakes on an announced bout between Silva and the UFC's Chuck Liddell in an interpromotional bout to determine who was the best light heavyweight in the world. Damn it, Crow Cop. Pride was nearly dead though, and it would only be a matter of time before Silva and Liddell would meet in the UFC. Vandy would have one more fight for the company before making the move to the UFC, and it was to defend his middleweight title against Dan Henderson at Pride 33. Silva had defeated Henderson in their first bout back at Pride 12, but things ended differently this time. After taking it to the champion for three rounds, Silva was KO'd again for the second time in a year, this time via a good old-fashioned punch. And just like that, everything was ruined. Silva and Liddell were supposed to be fighting for the title of the best light heavyweight ever, and now later that year, both fighters had lost their titles, and although the fight would happen and would be awesome, the stakes had been reduced drastically. Had it happened a year earlier, things would have been entirely different, but the bad year Silva had and the loss Liddell had to Rampage Jackson gave us what we got. So at UFC 79, they would finally meet and Vandy would suffer a third straight loss in what would be the fight of the year, but still, a loss is a loss. Pride's greatest fighter would have a rather lackluster UFC career after, going 4-4 four and four before leaving the organization. Number 4. Mark Coleman Mark Coleman was an unstoppable force when he burst onto the MMA scene in 1996. The D1 national champion and Olympic wrestler burned through UFC 10 and 11, winning both tournaments before capturing the inaugural UFC heavyweight title against Dan Severn at UFC 12. He looked unbeatable. That was until Maurice Smith at UFC 14. Smith, a kickboxer, had been training in multiple disciplines with Frank Shamrock and came into the bout as a true mixed martial artist, defeating an exhausted Mark Coleman via a decision with his grappling defense and superior striking. The upset was huge. Nobody expected Smith to even have a chance. It's then in 1998 that Mark's bad year really began. UFC 17 Redemption was named so for Mark. This was his chance to redeem his loss and regain the heavyweight title, which was now held by Randy Couture. Unfortunately, Couture had to pull out of the fight with an injury, so Mark would have to redeem himself against Pete Williams. It wasn't for a title, and it was a fight that most assumed Coleman would win, which is why everyone was shocked when the bout went similar to the Smith fight, but this time with an exhausted Coleman being KO'd for the first time with a head kick late in the fight. Not to be too deterred, Coleman would regroup, start training at the Lion's Den, and take on Pedro Hizo at UFC 18 in a title eliminator. Coleman fared much better in this bout, but in the end the judges gave a split decision to Hizo, a loss that many felt was pure robbery, including Coleman himself. After three devastating losses in the UFC, the former champion who had just a year prior seemed like the most unstoppable force in the whole sport, needed cash, and needed a fight. Both were available in Japan, but initially at the price of his reputation. In the last bout of our year-long timetable, Coleman would take a dive to Nobuhiko Takata via a heel hook in the second round. This fight has all but been confirmed as fixed and marks the lowest point in Coleman's career. It's hard to blame a fighter who was guaranteed another fight as well as money to support his family, and even though Mark would bounce back, of course, this year marked the darkest time in his legendary career, no doubt. Out. Number 3. Ben Askren Ben Askren is likely the name you thought of immediately when you saw the title of this list. Hell, he might even be in the thumbnail. But being an obvious choice doesn't make his 2019 any less devastating. Unbeaten for a decade, the former Bellator and one welterweight champion came out of a two-year retirement in 2019 in a first-time ever mixed martial arts promotional trade to the UFC for flyweight Demetrius Johnson. And the hype was beyond hype, almost exclusively due to Ben's ability to build said hype. Askren was everywhere and calling out everyone. 
His Twitter account was on fire. He was doing a million interviews, fan Q&As, podcasts. He was talking the biggest game, and the entire time he was abundantly clear he had come to the UFC for one reason, to prove to the world that he was the best welterweight of all time. A quest that, in his mind, would end with divisional gold and defeating George St. Pierre to seal his legacy as the greatest ever. Sounded fantastic on paper, but 2019 didn't go so hot. His massively anticipated debut would take place at UFC 235 against Robbie Lawler and almost immediately went south when he was dumped on his head and nearly finished on the ground. Some would argue that the fight should have been stopped, in fact. But Ben recovered and applied a bulldog choke until referee Herb Dean felt Lawler was unconscious and called the fight. Ruthless immediately sprung to his feet to contest the finish, and just like that, Ben's debut was marred with controversy and questions. Funky weathered the storm, though, and dismissed the naysayers in countless interviews in his lead-up to his second massively high-profile showdown with rising star Jorge Masvidal. Unlike like Lawler, the two-time Division I national champion laid into Masvidal with the shit-talking from the time the fight was announced until they got locked into the cage. The result? Ben was brutally KO'd with a flying knee in five seconds. Fans pounced at the chance to rub the pie in Ben's face, as fans tend to do when someone talks a big game. But Askren took the loss really well and geared up for a lesser profile fight against the well-respected 41-year-old Damian Maya in what was seen as arguably the two best grapplers ever in mixed martial arts finally meeting. It was a fight that Askren felt he could and should win if he truly was on the road to finish the quest he had started when he entered the organization. After a hard-fought three rounds, though, Maya would put Askren to sleep for the second time in 2019 with a rear naked choke. And suddenly, the perception of Ben had changed considerably. Many, including Askren himself, are discussing retirement. The prospect of a GSP fight almost now completely out of the question. 2019 was a rough year for Ben Askren, to say the least. Number 2. Fedor Emelianenko Fedor's legendary pride run of 16 bouts without a loss gave him a mythical status in the sport, and the world's greatest heavyweight would carry that with him, despite not going to the UFC after pride was purchased by Zufa. Fedor would go on to win fights in lesser promotions, but still manage to keep his mystique as the greatest fighter ever. Whoever was the top heavyweight in the UFC, the argument was always, well, what if Fedor was here? And several times, the UFC attempted to make that happen to no avail. By the time Fedor's bad year had started, he was unbeaten for nearly a decade, and had just defeated Brett Rogers in his Strike Force promotional debut to defend his Whamma heavyweight title. At 33, Emelianenko didn't seem to be slowing down at all. It looked like he might never lose. Fedor's next fight, Pride veteran Fabricio Verdum, who had been cut from the UFC after losing to Junior Dos Santos at UFC 90. As you can imagine, Fedor was a big favorite here. The moment that would make Verdum's career came a minute and nine seconds into the first round, when Fedor, who had dropped the Brazilian, was swinging wildly on the ground and got caught in a triangle armbar and forced to tap. Fedor had been defeated. All the what-if fights went out the window in just over a minute. The shocking defeat was followed by the opening round of the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix, where Fedor was expected to regain his foothold and make a run deep into the tournament, with a possible rematch with Verdum in round two. It was the highest rating Strike Force had ever had, and Fedor was in the main event against Bigfoot Silva. The second round saw Silva batter Fedor on the ground, and between rounds, the doctor determined his eye was too damaged to continue. Fedor had just lost two in a row, this time via a TKO. But fans still had hope. A doctor stoppage is a freak thing. Maybe the last emperor can rebound. Twelve and a half months after his first loss, though, Emelianenko would suffer a true TKO loss at the hands of Dan Henderson, essentially a middleweight, marking the end of the greatest era of a single heavyweight in the sport's history. Fedor's mystique was all but gone completely at that point, and it would never really recover. His epic run had ended, and it all came crashing down in a year's time. Number 1. Ronda Rousey it's rare that a single loss equals a bad year, but Ronda Rousey had a very bad 2015. Heading into her UFC 193 title defense against Holly Holm in an Australian football stadium, Rousey was the unbeaten queen of mixed martial arts and had ascended to unseen heights of popularity since her UFC debut in 2013. Rousey was starring in movies, she was hosting SportsCenter, she was doing commercials, she was announced to be on the cover of the new EA UFC game, she was set to play the lead in a remake of Roadhouse, two-time ESPN and female athlete of the year. What if she beat Floyd Mayweather in a fight? Joe Rogan had considered it. I shouldn't have said it at the time. 
<laughs> it was mass hysteria, which is why when her invincible facade fell via a dominant performance by Holm and a head kick to seal the deal, Rousey's world went crumbling to the ground as her body hit the canvas. Ronda went into exile but for a tearful interview with Ellen about her loss, and in the year that followed, everything changed. Fans turned on her. She wasn't seen as the unbeatable Tyson-like figure from before. That Roadhouse movie? Cancelled. Everything about Ronda's brand relied on her being the baddest fighter in the world, and now that she had been defeated in devastating fashion, all those opportunities and all that goodwill had vanished. After her year from hell that only consisted of a single fight, Rousey would return to the cage and fight the new champion Amanda Nunes at UFC 207. This event was huge. Over a million pay-per-view buys, Ronda was going to silence her critics and get back on track after her horrible year. Everyone wanted to know if Rousey could bounce back. A 48-second TKO loss only confirmed what everyone had already thought, and that was it. Besides being inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame in 2018, Rousey's MMA career ended in that moment. In just a year's time, Ronda went from the highest heights, from literally the biggest star in the entire sport, to a bitter career end, which is why there was no way she would be anything but number one on our list. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Huge shout out to Max Randall for editing this video together. Follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.